In our last lecture, we stopped at verse 23 of chapter 2. We will continue from there, where we left off. The last session was very interesting, perhaps for some a little bit esoteric, a little bit difficult. We talked about self-realization and breaking the alliance between the seer and the seen. While some of these things may seem difficult or esoteric, it is useful to understand the basic nature of the yogic anatomy, I call it, for the lack of a better word, how we are made up and how we can find a way out of this bondage. So it's not all just intellectual talk. My effort has always been to make it simple. Simple does not mean easy, but at least that one can begin to understand some of these concepts in such a way that eventually they turn out also to be a little bit useful. In verse 24, we talk about avidya once again, ignorance. Ignorance or avidya is the cause of this samyog or alliance between the seer and the seen. As a kind of a revision, we can just go back to the yogic anatomy and just refresh ourselves what was samyam again. Sorry, I got the wrong diagram. That's the one. Okay. Samyog. Samyog is when <clears throat> I'm having a little bit of difficulty with the with getting the right document in front of me, sorry. Just give me a minute. Yes. Okay. I got that now. So Samyog is this process of this continuity here. There is no break in the awareness. You see this seems to be one continuous flow. And everything is connected, interwoven with each other. So most of us are not able to distinguish the difference between our senses and the body. We are not aware of our breath, the working of the breath with the body and the mind. And we have very little self-awareness regarding how the mind works with relationship to our emotions, the health of the body, the connection between the two. It's all so interwoven, like a matrix. It's so completely... It's, it's like a... And I like to say it's like a pullover. It's so knitted together that it seems like one one thread you know it's you're not able to take it apart and this is some yoga and it's because this part here the awareness is also connected to the rest of the mind and body in the same manner so interwoven that we are not able to tell the difference between these parts, and that is samyog. And this samyog, 
or alliance between the seer, which is this part here, the center of consciousness, and the scene. The scene is everything else. The mind, the breath, the body, the senses, and all the objects in the world. They're all part of the scene. And because of this connection, which is called samyog, we suffer. This is what causes misery. This is what makes us suffer all the time. Because we lose our awareness and we are not able to distinguish between the seer, which is here, the center of consciousness, and the scene, which is the rest of it. So that was verse 24. Are there any questions about verse 24 of chapter 2? In a sense, this is almost like a recap of what we did in much more detail the last time. We talked about it the last time that this Samyog itself is basically us being here on this plane of existence, being able to live out our samskaras or desires. And this makes the world a very interesting place for us, like a playground for us to live out these desires. So it's not a bad thing, the world. A lot of people, seekers, think. The world is a bad place. I want to get out of here. This is bondage. And we give it a very, very negative coloring. In reality, the world is our playground. It's a beautiful place for us to live out some scars in a healthy manner and learn how eventually to break this alliance between the seer and the seen, which is what verse 25 explains breaking the alliance the samyog between the seer and the seen destroys ignorance and leads to liberation of the seer so what is that to return to our diagram this is what it means breaking samyog over here is also called viyog. That means there is a separation. This part is separated and the seer here, established here, looks through and witnesses the scene in a very detached manner, paramvaragya. And he sees everything, including his own mind as an instrument. There is no longer that involvement of falling into the mind and becoming one with that object, but a, a distance. And with that, viyog, you begin to see things as they are. You begin even to see the mind with all its conflicts, with all its contradictory thoughts, with all its emotions. and. It's like staring into the universe. It's like looking into the cosmos around us. And it's awe-inspiring. It's God-like. So this is the experience where one witnesses one's own mind. It's called V-Yog. So now if this is V-Yog, then what is Yog? What is that union? What union are we talking about in yoga? We always talk about yoga is union. What is union then? So the union happens when this is broken here, this connection to the scene is broken, then the center of consciousness is a drop. It's like a drop. It's like a seed. It's a drop of consciousness 
and it unites once again with the universal consciousness. So, if we see universal consciousness as a vast, vast ocean, the quality of this ocean is pure consciousness. And if you take a drop out of it, it's also pure consciousness. It's not different from the ocean. It's merely a drop. If this drop goes back to the ocean, what does it become? It becomes the ocean. So once this center of consciousness here is freed by breaking the alliance, this center of consciousness goes back to the universal consciousness and becomes one with it. And that is yoga. So we understood three main concepts here, samyog, viyog, and yog. So it's useful to understand this, these three and the difference between the three of them. <clears throat> they are very uh, different. For a lot of people, they create a lot of confusion in the minds of people because those who don't practice and if you read very academic books <clears throat> written by um, scholars who are not practicing, not a part of a living meditative tradition, then what happens is things are written in a language that almost nobody can understand and there's a lot of misunderstanding it's a bit like <clears throat> you know this game chinese whispers where you whisper one thing to somebody and then at the end of the chain some garbled stuff comes out and it's a bit like that it creates a great deal of misunderstanding in reality it is simple to understand. It is not easy to realize directly through experience, but the basic concept is not difficult. Any questions about this? Okay, everybody seems to be good. In that case, we can continue. We can go back to verse 26 onwards. We come now to the more practical aspect. It's not as difficult anymore. And it gets easier, a little bit easier, and uh, more familiar grounds for most of us. Verses 26 to 29 talk about the eight limbs of yoga and sense of discrimination, buddhi. So verse 26, uninterrupted distinction between seer and seen is the means to liberation. So what I explained as some yog, breaking that alliance, the yog, is called vivek khyati. Viveka means discrimination. So vivek khyati is distinguishing between the seer and the seen. And when that happens for a longer period of time, uninterrupted, this becomes a means to liberation. It leads to Vyog, which eventually leads to Yog. Now, many of us 
have perhaps had brief glimpses of this. Sometimes in a moment of extreme relaxation, feel really content, happy, and you just relax totally. You feel connected to everything and then suddenly something happens. Something shifts. The way you look at things and you suddenly f- become very self-aware. You become aware of your thoughts, your mind, your body, everything around you. And then suddenly this question comes hammering through your mind. Who am I? Why am I here? What is this? What is the meaning of life? These kind of moments are little insights. They have also been called fleeting samadhis. And basically, these kind of moments of extreme relaxation, it might be you go for a walk, you look at the seaside and you look at this beautiful ocean, its vastness, or you just very angry about something and in the moment suddenly of extreme anger you begin to see yourself or extreme sadness when you've perhaps lost somebody. It can be in many different situations that this happens and you acquire a sense of distance to your own mind and body heightened sense of awareness. When that happens, it is a glimpse of samadhi called fleeting samadhi. And basically, these are temporary, momentary flashes of vivek kyati. While this itself may not lead to final liberation, they're very useful moments because they help you to understand such concepts and they let you see the world differently. You start seeing the world in a different way, even if they're just brief moments. If they're very brief, you may not even catch it. It just slips away. You can't hold on to it. And it slips away so fast that you're back into the world and you almost, you just missed it. But if they're a little bit more intense or if you're able to sustain it for a slightly longer period of time, then the memory of that remains with you. <clears throat> you do not forget and you hold on to that moment. And that makes the big difference. That is what brings us to things like yoga. That starts off a search and brings us into yoga or meditation or just a search, however however it should be. It doesn't have to be yoga. It could be something else. So that is about Vivek Khyati. Any questions about this? About the fleeting samadhis? About glimpses, insights? In that case, we go to verse 27 of chapter 2, which is the seven levels of insights of prajya, knowledge, seven levels of knowledge that come to the one who has acquired Vivek Khyati. 
So having acquired for a longer period of time <clears throat> this sense of distinction between the seer and the seen, you begin to acquire certain knowledge. What is this knowledge that you acquire? This has been explained in the Vyas Bhasyam. It's not been explained in the Yoga Sutras, but it has been explained in the Vyas Bhasyam. And there are seven levels of knowledge. It's important to understand that most of the time, people think of Vivekyati or, or yoga or enlightenment, however you want to call it, as a sudden transformative moment. And we like to imagine that this is going to happen suddenly one day and everything, all suffering, misery is going to just disappear. That may be what we have heard from stories about some great masters. For example, we hear the story about Raman Maharishi. And so we like to think that it's a very sudden and powerful earth-shaking experience and then one is done. But what we forget is that masters like this have done their work, their effort in another lifetime, in previous lifetimes. Therefore, It's not as if it just happened one day suddenly to them without any effort, but they did their effort in a previous lifetime. So we go through stages. Whether we go through those stages in this lifetime, all in one, or over different lifetimes, that's depending on the intensity of practice, intensity of desire. So this is a form of evolution that takes place. It's an expansion of consciousness and it comes in stages. So at every stage you acquire some knowledge, you gain power, you expand consciousness and you're able to integrate that energy until you then have integrated it and move on to the next level. So this comes in stages. Fortunately, it comes in stages because if it would come all at once, it would be very difficult to integrate that energy. It's like taking a small little uh, lamp, the bulb from a small little lamp, and you know you you are you connect it to some massive power cable, and what's going to happen? that little bulb is going to fuse. It cannot take that kind of energy. So those few rare mystics who have achieved something or attained something very fast in a very uh, dramatic way generally have done their work in previous lifetimes. And for everybody else, it's a slower process and it's a more gradual process and it goes through seven stages of insights. The first stage, once you've had this, even if it's a momentary experience of the separation, of this distinction between the seer and the seen, the practitioner now knows the things he must let go of. What does it mean to let go? That he realizes what is useful and what's not useful. He begins to understand, for example, that material objects will disintegrate, they are transitory, and that a great deal of attachment to material objects is not very useful. So those people who are very attached 
to sensory objects. They would find this person now to be very different, uh, very otherworldly, disinterested in, in things that others are normally interested in. And this is the first insight, in the loss of interest in material things. It doesn't mean that he doesn't use these material things but he is no longer attached to them. He uses them in a different way. He uses them without getting attached. The second insight is that the practitioner knows the coloring that is the cause of attachment to these things and the strength of this coloring has been reduced until it can no longer be reduced. So what does this mean? Let's have a look at this closely. The coloring is all here. This is all the coloring in the conscious mind, of course. Sorry, I'm not good at drawing here. And of course, in the unconscious mind, where we have created our habit patterns, thinking habit patterns, behavioral habit patterns, all unconsciously. And now the second insight is through time, the practitioner realizes that the coloring must be reduced. He begins to get less and less attached to not only objects, but also relationships. He sees his attachment there as well. And this does not make him insensitive. In fact, he becomes even more loving, uh, selfless, and expands in his love for, for people, but without getting emotionally attached. So the coloring attenuates, becomes less and less, which means that the conscious mind expands. So this is expanding, he's becoming more conscious, keeps getting more and more conscious until there is nothing really much left in the unconscious mind. It's all attenuating, it's losing power. So that's the second insight. So it has been reduced now, this coloring, until it can no longer be reduced. So what happens next? Liberation is now only a matter of practice and realization. So he only has to continue a little bit more and sooner or later it is going to happen. You saw the diagram, you saw how the conscious mind kept expanding and the unconscious mind kept reducing. And then sooner or later it's going to happen that there's not, no coloring left in the unconscious mind and liberation is happening. He realizes that it's going to happen. It's not happened, but he knows it's just a matter of time and practice. Fourth realization, uh, coming back to the third one, he understands it's a matter of practice and realization is a very important insight because for most people, not having had the direct experience, it's a matter of blind faith. You read books, you have a teacher, you believe your teacher, or you believe the books, the scriptures, but you've not had a direct experience. So you understand now why this is such a big insight, because it's no longer blind faith or just believing somebody else. It's not a testimony of your teacher or the scriptures. 
it's not just an inference like yes logically this seems to happen but it's now direct experience and this is quite different from testimony or inference right this leads to the fourth insight that is acquiring that acquiring a sharp sense of discrimination is the means to liberation has been understood. So now, because meditation has increased to the extent that coloring has been reduced, these samskaras do not have a power over you anymore. They have not been burnt finally in the fire of knowledge but they have very little power over you so you know now that the key is a sharp sense of discrimination very sharp buddhi is required and that has now been understood so these are four insights which will liberate one from rituals, from other external practices, and they also liberate from the binding power of karma, which means you understand those actions that are useful and those are not useful. You don't spend your time forming actions, getting yourself into a web of confusion, because you know what is to be done. You simplify your life. You don't spend your time doing external practices and rituals because these cannot really help you. So these are the four insights regarding actions. Now there are three insights with reference to the mind itself. Any questions regarding these first four insights? Okay, good. Um, there's a question. Will these insights come according to the given order? Yes, more or less. They do come in this order because that's the nature of the mind and the process. You've seen the human, the yogic anatomy now. And you know that it's very unlikely that one can just jump over and skip over things. Evolution happens very steadily and consciousness expands gradually. So one generally does not skip over steps. It may be speeded up. Depending on the method you use, you may it may hasten the process, but you generally do not skip over steps or stages. And these four stages are generally what you will go through when you meditate and uh, expand your consciousness. So then the next three insights lead to liberation from the mind itself. So the first four liberate us from the binding power of karma and the next three liberate from the mind itself. So the next insight is that buddhi serves the seer. So buddhi is actually in the mind itself. Okay. Buddhi is not separate from the mind. Buddhi is somewhere in the mind here, in the unconscious mind, in the conscious mind. It's, it's right here, in the conscious mind. So, if Buddhi is here in the mind, 
but we say buddhi is to be sharp. It leads many practitioners to believe that buddhi is somehow the same as consciousness, pure consciousness. It's not. Buddhi is part of the mind. Buddhi serves the center of consciousness. Buddhi is a servant, an instrument of the master here, the Purusha or Atman. And this is now very clear to the person because he has meditated, he has direct experience. For those who don't have direct experience, they have a lot of trouble distinguishing between the different aspects of the mind. And they mix up very often buddhi and ahankara. Sometimes ahankara is speaking in this nice voice and telling you, oh, you have to practice. You have to do this. It's good for you. But then it turns out, though it sounds like the voice of buddhi, Perhaps you are doing too much. You're pushing yourself. It's violent. Maybe you need to do a little less. And when Buddhi tells you, do less, you think, oh, that's that lazy part of me. So we are not able to distinguish between Buddhi, Ahankara, Manas, Chitta. But a practitioner who has experienced now Vivek Khyati for a longer period of time. He is seeing with amazing clarity and he sees that Ahankara, Manas, Chitta, Buddhi, he sees them very clearly as separate aspects. And he sees also that Buddhi, though very similar here, has similar qualities to the center of consciousness. It's very sattvic. In comparison to Ankara or Manasachita, still it is not pure consciousness. It is not Purusha. It is not center of consciousness. The sixth insight, buddhi, the sense of discrimination, no longer appropriates all objects for itself. Thus begins an irreversible process of dissolving back into the source of all things. Now it's very clear to the practitioner, buddhi, wonderful as it was, wonderful servant, wonderful instrument, but even buddhi is not it, neti neti. Buddhi is also not that. And this begins an irreversible process of dissolving back to what? The source of all things, which is the center of consciousness. And then when that happens, the seer shines forth. It is self-luminous like the sun. The mind is not self-luminous. Buddhi is not self-luminous. Buddhi appears to have a light. The word buddhi comes from buddh, which means light. And it's got this name, buddhi, like light, because it appears it has that quality of having light or consciousness. But it's like the moon. It's reflected light. And the true light is that of the seer. And that is self-luminous. It has its own light. So these insights, these last three insights are internal. The first four insights were external, referring to the power, binding power of karma. And the last three are referring to liberation from the mind itself. These are internal.
any questions regarding these insights? We come now to verse 28, and from now gets a little bit easier, a little bit more practical. And this verse tells us, through the practice of the different limbs of yoga, the impurities diminish, knowledge rises, and leads to discriminative enlightenment. That is Vivek Kyati. So, what are the different limbs? What are limbs? Limbs are anga. Anga means limbs. That is referring to Ashtanga, the eight limbs of yoga. And these limbs of yoga, they help to reduce the impurities. What are the impurities that we are referring to? We are referring to the impurities in the unconscious mind. What we call impurities in the Yoga Sutras is basically kleshas or coloring, samskaras, all meaning the same thing. And these are reduced through Ashtanga, the eight limbs of yoga. There is a kind of a brand name, yoga brand, uh, that is called Ashtanga. Uh, they have shifted and they now call it Vinyasa. Earlier it was called Ashtang Yoga. And so here, this Ashtanga has nothing to do with any specific style of yoga. This refers to the different aspects of yoga that are put together to create a systematic or a comprehensive approach to meditation. So, this is um, this Ashtang is important to understand that we are not referring here to steps. Very often, Ashtanga has been translated in English as the eight steps of yoga or the eight parts of yoga. In reality, the word uses anga. Anga means limbs. What are the limbs? The body has four limbs, two arms and two legs. These are the extremities, four limbs. In yoga, there are eight limbs. Now, imagine you have a body and how would it be without one of these limbs? Obviously not going to be very uh, complete. And normally, you use all your limbs together. You don't use your limbs step by step. You don't say, first I'm going to use my right hand. Now I'm going to use my left hand. Then I use my left leg. And after that, I'm going to use my right leg. Obviously, ridiculous idea. The idea of limbs implies that we do all, all of them and we use all of them together. It's a very different when you think of it in terms of steps. There are eight of these. So we have observance, commitments, posture, energy exercises, meditation, etc. And a lot of people have said, teachers who are saying, these are steps and first you have to form a foundation based on observances and commitments, then you learn master asanas, after you've mastered asanas, only then you start pranayam. And only when you've mastered that, you start with meditation. But this is not what the Yoga Sutra is saying. The Yoga Sutra refers to limbs and not to steps. 
So, because we tend to think in a linear manner in our modern world, there's a lot of emphasis on linear thinking, logical thinking, and therefore we like to think in terms of steps. So verse 29 enumerates the eight Ashtanga. You can see already the problem is that because of the structure here, it appears in an order. So first comes the Yama, which is the observances, then the commitments, then posture, then Pranayam, Pratyahar, which is training and directing the senses inward, Dharna, which is for focusing the mind towards an object of meditation, Dhyan, when awareness flows towards that object of meditation, Samadhi, which is the direct experience of the distinction between the seer and the seen. And so, of course, it appears now that this is leading from the external to the internal. And yes, it is. It does lead from internal to the external. But in practice, it does not mean that you first have to master the first and the second and the third and the fourth. Because our mind and our personality is not set up like this. We are very complex human beings. And we can work with all of these. Perhaps your dharna, your attempts at meditation may not be very successful. But it is important that you do start the process of learning this and integrating this in your life. Because if you don't do it now, it's going to be too late to do it when 50 years from now, when you're older. Because your, your yamas are probably never going to be perfect. Your commitments are probably also never going to be perfect. What is perfection? It's all a matter of learning to live in our very complex world. What is perfection then? We talk about asan siddhi being perfection, but that's also not really perfection. It's just learning to sit still. It's not doing complicated gymnastics. So this idea of being perfect in something and then moving to the next stage does not work here. Ashtanga implies very, actually it's not even implication, it's in practice, in the oral tradition, it's very clear that one learns to do all of these. Even samadhi, you may not have direct experience, but you can acquire a certain understanding through contemplation and through fleeting samadhis. Moments of insight during meditation. This idea of steps like on a ladder has created a great deal of misunderstanding in practice and it has forced a lot of sincere seekers who want to do more to be stuck at a level which they should not be stuck at. Any questions about verse 28 and 29, Ashtanga?
So the Yoga Sutras now goes into an explanation of each of the Angas and many of you may be familiar with some of these concepts and ideas. Maybe you have practiced some of these. The first one in verse 30 mentions the the yamas or the observances and they are enumerated here ahimsa satya asteya brahmacharya aparigraha are the observances i have translated the word yamas as observances in certain places they have been translated as restraints even as commandments. Those coming from a religious background, from especially from um, the religions of the book, they have a concept of commandments. You shall do this and not do that. And you may think of these as the don'ts, do not do this. But these are not commandments. We say observances because you can observe and understand how to integrate these in your life. They are values, they are guidelines that lead to self-awareness. If you try to impose these on yourself, what you will see is, with a bit of self-awareness, is that it is nothing other than ahankara that imposes things on oneself. So discipline is a matter of a great deal of self-awareness. Ahimsa which I'm saying, non-violence, non-injury. What does ahimsa mean? Can you just randomly say, I'm becoming a vegetarian from today, that is ahimsa. If you do that, you will create a sort of a rigid rule for yourself. And in doing that, you will lose an opportunity to discover the deeper meaning of ahimsa. Ahimsa can also mean not gossiping or speaking badly about others. Not being rude and saying hurtful things to people. Ahimsa is not just about physical violence, it's also about mental violence, emotional violence. You can say, I don't speak to somebody Rather than say mean things when I'm angry, I just don't talk. Would that be considered to be nonviolent? Well, if you don't speak to somebody, he feels your violence. Maybe that's even worse because you now don't even give an opportunity to talk about the problem with that person. What about that violence that you do to yourself when you push yourself over your limits in certain areas? When you set extreme high standards on yourself, is that not violence against yourself? What about satya, truth? Should one be truthful? to the extent that you say mean and hurtful things to people, you must have experienced that dilemma sometimes when you have to, to decide maybe to lie, uh, a white truth it's called, a white lie, sorry, a white lie maybe to a little child and you know, they scribble and they, they call that a, a painting. 
and there are these little scribbles there and they say oh look i drew this wonderful house would you just say brutally to this child oh that's just a lot of scribbles that's not a house no you don't do that you admire these scribbles and say what a wonderful house you've drawn So satya is something to ponder about, to contemplate. What about, I've used words like authenticity, integrity, non-deception. Sometimes when somebody asks you something, you don't lie, but you don't say the truth either. So you deceive by keeping quiet about something. That's also deception. That's also a lie, a form of lying. So you may have noticed here, in Ahimsa, it is presented in a negative form, non-violence. But in truth, it is put in a very affirmative way. It's not put in a negative way like, don't lie. It doesn't say non-lying. It says truth. Because you could by keeping silent, also be lying or deceiving. So, the form in which it's put is very important. Asteya, sorry, is non-stealing. See, again, it is put in this negative form, non-stealing. Don't take the things of others. Is this only about material objects? Could you not steal somebody's ideas? Could you not steal someone's affections? So stealing can have a deeper meaning. Brahmacharya is again put in a very affirmative manner. The word brahmacharya creates a big controversy because it's often translated as celibacy. I beg to defer because I think it's a much broader uh, <clears throat> meaning. Brahma means the world, to walk in Brahman. Acharya means to walk, to walk in Brahman. Brahma, Brahma means consciousness, to walk in consciousness is to have a certain self-mastery, discipline, self-discipline, be very balanced. It's a balanced way of life. And it can also refer to a balanced life in regulating one's sexuality. But it is not restricted only to sexuality. So Brahmacharya is again an affirmative. Aparigraha, again, Put in a form which is negative, non holding, non possessiveness. Don't hold on to things, let go. Don't keep collecting. If you look in your house, I'm sure that you can take open your cupboard and remove half the, the things you have collected from there. We just keep hanging on to things. It's very hard to just throw away things because they have no value anymore to you, but we still hang on to these. So, leading a simple life, basically, no hoarding. You don't need so much material stuff. Also, hoarding can be hanging on to old emotions, old ways of thinking and ideas, attachments. Memories. Don't hold your memories, old memories you have. Let go of them. So you see how much deeper the meaning can be if you contemplate on these and if you explore and play with these rather than making rigid rules out of the observances. Questions about the Yamas. I 
okay, we seem to be good. Then we can stop here. Those of you who would like um, to, if you're not connected to me on Facebook, you can ask for friendship, you can join our group, that first uh, yoga satsang. And that is um, something I would like to, to ask you if you want to do that. You can also catch up on some of these um, online meetings on our channel, which is that first English. And um, yes, so it was nice to have you. And we end this session. And we see you all next Friday. So have a nice Friday. It's Friday the 13th. So I hope you're not getting superstitious about it. <laughs> have a nice weekend, everyone. Bye-bye. Namaste, Balaji. Bye, Krishna. Bye, Manoj. Bye, Debbie. Bye, Shibu.